Um, so yes, I've been treating secular things as if they were sacred for about 10 years when I um, started at Harvard Divinity School. Um, I think it's important to understand that I am very, very Jewish. I love being Jewish. Um, my Jewishness is a huge part of my identity and I practice a lot of Jewish um, practices and, and holidays and you know, we do Shabbat dinner in my house. And yet I'm also an atheist and I was raised as both Jewish and an atheist. And the reason for that, I think my family comes by that quite honestly. Um, I'm the grandchild of four, not only Holocaust survivors, but Auschwitz survivors. Two of my grandparents met in Auschwitz, which as somebody who now um, talks about romance novels fairly professionally is not technically a meet cute. I don't think anything too cute really happened in Auschwitz, but um, uh, so I was raised really, my, my father specifically raised us that if there's a God, he hates us. And so he would rather believe that there isn't a God. Um, and my atheism is really important to me. I obviously, as someone who went to divinity school and really identifies as Jewish, do not think that religion is stupid. I am not a new atheist or, um, any number of other ways that atheists self-identify. I respect and love religion a great deal. However, I, it's important for me in the work that I do to believe that everything that happens on earth is up to us, um, it, to humanity. Um, everything that happens to humanity is up to us and that there's no uh, justice in the afterlife. That justice has to be something that we fight for here on earth. And that is absolutely a theological reflection. And I find that people of all different kinds of religion believe in that also. Atheism is just the way that I find most clarifying in the simplest way to get my brain to really be trying to advocate for justice on earth. Um, I always thought I was going to be a teacher. I went to college uh, and was an English major and my plan was to be a high school English teacher. I tried that for a few years. I honestly, um, there are a lot of reasons that I can talk about if you all are interested in the questions and answers as to why I did not feel suited to be a teacher. Um, so I started working in an education nonprofit. And after 10 years of working in the education field, I realized that I actually do think that we as a country know how to fix our education system. I think that we culturally just don't believe that poor black and brown children deserve to learn. Um, I think that there's an active attempt, actually, this, I'm not trying to use conspiracy theory language to um, keep poor black and brown children, um, you know, dissociated from parts of society. And certainly we don't care enough to put forth an effort to educate them. And while fixing our education system would obviously be incredibly difficult, I actually think the solutions are very simple, difficult, but simple. And so I was getting increasingly frustrated with the fact that I was like, look, we know what to do, right? You <laughs> fund schools, you're respective of their tax base, you pay teachers $150,000 a year, right? Like they're just like very simple policy solutions. And I felt as though I was in a world of education nonprofits that was, you know, that was um, rearranging deck furniture on the Titanic. And it just was feeling more and more depressing to me. Now, obviously, I think the people who work in the education field are doing that important work of trying to rebuild the ship. It just didn't feel like that was what I was doing. And so I really gave a lot of thought as to what it was that I wanted to do by working in education. And um, and how I wanted to spend my life. And it became clear to me that the reason that we don't want to, you know, educate um, marginalized communities is a sole problem for us as a country, that this is hundreds of years of religious history, this is um, a sort of backwards idea of manifest destiny, that these are religious ideas and soul, soul breaks in us that we do not see humanity in one another. 
And then the other thing, honestly, is that I was turning 30 and um, it was during the 2008, 2009 financial crisis. And I was like, I'm never going to get to retire. There will be no social security for me. I was very bleak at the time. It, I feel more optimistic about these things now. And I was like, I might as well have a job that I really want to do until the day that I die. I have to work till the day that I die. And so I decided to apply to divinity school. One, because the subject matter really interested me of this these soul cultural problems. And then also three of my favorite things to do are read, write, and chat. And I thought if I become a hospital chaplain or a prison chaplain, university chaplain, like that is what I think my job is going to be is reading, writing, and chatting. So that just seemed like a really good idea for me. So when I got to divinity school, um, I, I loved my time at Harvard Divinity School and it slightly oversold how pluralistic it was and how well it had integrated not just different religions, but different spiritualities. And I think that their language was aspirational and just not yet realized. And I had a really difficult time studying Judaism in a way that felt, uh, not, forget authentic to me, that felt not upsetting to me. Um, there was no conversation separating theology from the literature of Judaism, at least not taught by with a Jewish scholarly mindset. Um, and so I found oh, I found all the classes that I took on Judaism to not really account for or answer the questions you know that the Holocaust brings up, right? At theologies of suffering, theocracies were just like not things that were actually being discussed in class. And so I tried going to synagogues and I tried really finding my Jewish community. And, and I, I just kept feeling frustrated by feeling as though I didn't have a place. And, you know, then I started talking to more and more people. And it obviously turns out that a lot of people feel this way, that their, their religion that they grew up with and that they feel a great tie to do not feel totally comfortable in their church or mosque or synagogue. And, um, and right, like we now know this, right, that Pew keeps on putting, putting out these studies that more and more millennials, especially, and I'm sure that this will bear out also with Gen Z or unaffiliated from churches, people are feeling isolated and a tremendous sense of loneliness. There's an epidemic of loneliness in the United States. And I think a lot of that is because people are feeling um, removed from their religion and their, their religious communities, which really oriented so much of American society for so long. And so I wanted community and I wanted an authentic way to think about, you know, about what a God could be, even in my atheism, what God language could be. And most importantly, I just wanted to be in conversation with something, with someone, someone to make sure that I wasn't spiraling, that I wasn't having um, thoughts that were leading me into bad, bad decisions, right? We all need these communities. And so eventually I asked the woman who was my favorite professor, um, her name is Stephanie Paulsell, and she is um, ordained in the United Church of Christ and is, uh, you know, the daughter of a Christian minister and the granddaughter of a Christian minister. Um, but she was very interested in re um, religion and literature. And so I asked her if she would teach me how to pray uh, with my favorite book, Jane Eyre. And the reason that I asked her to do this is because I, my mom is here tonight and she can vouch for this. I love a really easy goal. I am, I like, I'm a very couch to 5k type person. I'm like, oh, first time stand up off the couch. Okay. And if couch to 5k is telling me I can do it in three months, I'm like, I'm going to try to do it in nine months. Like I love a low bar. And so I thought if I'm gonna teach myself how to pray, which sounds really hard, I would like to teach myself how to pray with something that I think is really easy to engage with. And my favorite book is gonna be really easy to engage with. Unlike the Torah, which, you know, when I go to temple and there's a story of God's benevolence, I'm like, well, you sure aren't thinking about the girls in the basements, you know, for the Boko Haram right now, right? Like there was just constantly this part of me that was arguing and was, not able, for lack of a better term, to suspend my disbelief in order to engage in spiritual um, in spiritual thought and contemplation. 
And so Stephanie said yes, that she would work with me on how to pray with a secular text. She was like, I don't really know how to do this either. Like I know how to do it with the Bible um, and with like a traditional liturgy, um, sorry, a traditional lectionary, but let's give this a shot. And I mean, I think that part of this, you all will know where this is going. It turns out Jane Eyre is also a complicated book and not very easy to treat as sacred when you look closely at it. I had a mildly naive idea as to what it would be to treat a text as sacred. I, I knew that Jane Eyre was problematic and I am gonna spoil Jane Eyre for the next minute or so. So if you wanna, you know, remove your earbuds for a minute, but right, like the love interest has his wife locked up in an attic. So like, I, I, I wasn't like, this book is feminist and wonderful. But what I, I did not realize the extent to which, you know, like um, Bronte believed in phrenology, but like reading of someone's brow and that you could tell on a racial level how intelligent someone was. And I, like, I, there were just so many things that were so invisible to me when I was reading the book just for fun which I had done six or seven times before I engaged in this experiment. And so Stephanie and I, I, we read through the book three times together over a semester, the first two times fairly quickly. Um, I read the 600 page novel in a week, which I am not a fast reader. So that is all I did that week. And then we read it over sort of the course of a month to familiarize ourselves with the text. And then we read it one more time over the course of four months. And in that second time is really where I did at least the beginning of some of the reckoning of the places where I wanted to pay attention that were not problematic even, but just troubling for me in my spiritual journey. Um, for example, there's a young girl in an orphanage named Helen. I'm going to do some spoiling again. I feel okay about this morally because it's a 200 year old book. But again, I understand if you want to peace out for a minute. Um, there's a girl, Helen, who is dying of tuberculosis, and on her deathbed, she says, it's fine that I'm dying. There is no place for me on earth, and she gives all of the reasons. She's like, my father is remarried. My mother is dead. I'm not going to be able to find a job. No one is going to want to marry me, and she's very convincing. <laughs> You're like, true, there is no place for you on this earth, and while Bronte is advocating overall for girls like Helen, what she was advocating for was that they shouldn't die of tuberculosis. She was not actively advocating for them to have a way in the world, right? And like these types of things upon that second reading with Stephanie, I was like, okay, this is gonna be something I wanna pay attention to. And then that last time is where we looked closely at those types of pain points and where we developed a, um, a method for what it means to treat a secular text as sacred. And so I will share this with you, um, that it, it's three steps, but there's a secret first step. I've just already accidentally had done it, which is that if you wanna treat a secular text as sacred, which let me just say one more thing before I go into the if. Treating it, I recommend treating a secular text as sacred. I think that, it is incredibly personal. You get to have a very specific type of baggage, like with Harry Potter, where JK Rowling is transphobic, and but there's like a knowable amount of baggage with it. There aren't hundreds of years of theology and um, church politics and right, like, you know, there's the famous story about Hillary Rodden Clinton, who when she was first lady, they um they were like, Oh, be careful working in healthcare. And she was like, I was on the board of a church. I can do anything, right? Like with secular texts, there just isn't that kind of baggage associated with it. And I think that no matter how religious you are, treating a secular text as sacred is a great practice to add to your life. It is so personal, which leads to the, the first step, which is pick a text that you love and love some of what it's generated. So what we talked about with the sacred text is that one of the ways that you can tell that a text is sort of right for being treated as sacred is that it is generative. It does not stop conversation. It does not answer questions, but it creates more questions. So for example, my dishwashing soap, right? It does not 
create any more questions, the label, right? It answers all of my questions. What are the ingredients and where was this made? And is the bottle plastic, right? Like all of my questions are answered on that. Whereas a book, even like Harry Potter, right? Creates fan fiction and theme parks. And we can talk about the capitalism of that, but it creates book clubs and, you know, people are knitting scarves and their house colors, right? It expands our imagination. And so, and I think we have to look about, look at not just the text to measure its worth, but what it generated, right? You can't be a good teacher and have all of your students fail in the classroom, right? The way to judge a good teacher is whether or not their students are learning. And I think the same is true for a text. And in looking at Jane Eyre, Jane Eyre is incredibly problematic, but less problematic if you look at it in the context of what it's created. You know, Wide Sargasso Sea is this great example of it. It was written by Jane Reese in the 1960s. She wrote it like over the course of 40 years, but published in the 1960s where it wondered about that woman in the attic and what was her backstory and what happened to her that she got there and how horrible was it? And there are new versions of uh, Jane Eyre coming out all the time. White, uh, Rachel Hawkins, who's a famous young adult author, just wonderful author in general, recently wrote um, the Wife Upstairs, and this is constantly happening. We have a Korean-American version of Jane Eyre. There are bountiful examples that, of things that Jane Eyre has generated, and I love the things that it's generated, and it's complicated the text, because now when you look at Jane Eyre, you also have to look at the Jane Eyre musical into under, in order to understand Jane Eyre's impact. So that's step one of when you want to pick your text. Step two, we use the word faith. And by faith, all that I mean is that you have the faith that the more time you spend with the text, the more gifts it will give you. And gifts <laughs> on a, or, or the more blessings it will give you. Gifts and blessings aren't always fun and easy, right? I got Rory, my dog, as a gift, and she is absolutely a blessing. And my mom, who is here tonight, can attest that when I got her as a puppy, I thought she was an evil demon who was trying to ruin my life. So, right, like these things do not always come easily to us. I have to walk her. I, I would say that she is one of my sacred practices, having this dog. Um, right, like I have to walk her in the snow. I have to walk her even when I don't want to, right? Like they're, it's not always easy, but it is always life-giving to know that I am engaged in a relationship with something innocent that I have a responsibility to take care of. And it's the same with texts, right? There are going to be moments where you realize that it's not just that Rochester was a bad husband to Bertha, but like also that he is like a really bad surrogate father to Adele. And you're going to constantly realize how disappointing whatever book it is that you love or TV show or movie or a piece of art or baseball, right? You're going to be disappointed. But even that is, is a spiritual blessing. It will teach you something and serve you. So that is faith. Then step two or three, depending if we're counting the first one, we'll just say step three. Um, we talk about rigor. And that can look like any number of things. Um, Mary Gordon, who is one of my favorite novelists, um, at least the last time I saw her speak, which was now several years ago, thank you, COVID, talks about how she um, reads Proust for 10 minutes every morning. And she's been doing it for 30 years at this point. And that, right, like that is a commitment, a rigorous commitment. And it's something, right, like it's like eight minute abs. Like it seems like a small commitment, just 10 minutes a day, but over years, it's this huge rigorous commitment. She travels with Proust in order to make sure that it's always with her. Proust, those books are heavy. <laughs> like it, right? It, this is a literal commitment that she carries on her body. And then the other thing with rigor is that we, um, through all of my work with the various podcasts that I've done in um, our pilgrimages, have like frankly appropriated <laughs> Judeo-Christian reading, sacred reading practices, which I'm sure many of you engage in, Lectio Divina, Pardis, Gloria Legia. So, and we together are going to do one of these practices in order to demonstrate the kind of thing that I mean. But we quite freely steal from Judeo-Christian religions. I feel fine stealing from Christianity as it is the dominant culture and Judaism is mine. So. Um, 
and really these practices force us to um to what Guigo the second would say is lower a ladder into a text and slowly rung by rung get ourselves deeper and deeper into the text and those those rituals i think can really add to that rigor the fourth step is community and i would say it is like the most optional of the ways to treat a text as sacred and yet it is one of the most additive um and that that is really simple right it is reading even just with one other person and we all know this right you're more likely to go to the gym if you're meeting someone there you're more likely to go on a walk you're more you know you're just more likely to to behave in a way that lives up to your values if you're doing it with somebody else but the other reason for community isn't just to make sure you show up it's to prevent you from fundamentalism right from being lost in your own thought and staying too committed to your own thought and from being lost to despair being like do you know what this book is really sexist i'm not going to read it anymore because that is a fair feeling but if you have a partner who's like yes it is let's keep going let's actually read this in conversation with audra lord she wrote a lot about jane eyre right you are just going to be able to get through more better and healthier. So um, so as I said, I've been doing this for about 10 years. I started Divinity School will be 10 years this fall. And I just want to give you an example. So my book is on treating Jane Eyre as a sacred text. And this, what I'm about to share is not in my book because I just did a podcast treating Jane Eyre as sacred for about a year and got, which got me thinking a lot more about it. And so, for example, the second, the first sentence of chapter two of Jane Eyre is, I resisted all the way. And it is a sentence that I have meditated on a lot, right? And it, it very, on like a very literal level, Jane is being dragged into a room to be punished because she's just, her cousin hit her and she had the audacity to hit him back. And so she's being dragged against her will into this room. So she is literally telling us that she resisted all the way into this room. But there is an argument to be made, and many brilliant scholars have made it, that that is essentially the thesis of the novel. And I find that idea fascinating. Jane Eyre is really closely describes two years in Jane's life with this weird eight year break in the middle that is contained in a paragraph. And then again, you get this weird three month break that is contained in a paragraph. And as a reader, I've always been like, why, like, why don't you wanna tell me about this time? And if we think about the book as chronicling her moments of resistance, those lapses in time are moments in which she didn't need to resist. She was in school and she was getting a decent education and she was happy enough. So there was no resistance. And again, in those three months, she was living with the family that she liked and there was just nothing to resist. And it made me realize that maybe I want to mark my life by the things that I resist and the things that I give into and think of those moments where I feel like I can give in as moments of luck and privilege and actually thinking about my identity as being defined by the things that I choose to resist, the moments in which I choose to resist and what it is that I am resisting. And so by treating that text as sacred for as long as I did and really meditating on that line, I find myself thinking about like, what is giving in and what is resistance and um, how can I live up to that value in my life? Which things do I wanna resist and when? Um, and so I have found this to be a really fruitful way to meditate on how I want to live my life. I have been um, doing this as part of my organization, Not Sorry Productions, for the last five years. We now have these um, three podcasts. And um, the, the, the most fun part of that to me is that we now have over 100 local greet, greeting groups that we're meeting all over the world, <laughs> then went to Zoom and are now starting to meet in person again, like really from like Latvia to Manhattan. Um, we And 
it is incredible the relationships that are built and the ideas that are generated, ones that I certainly never would have thought of in these groups. And my the thing that I am proudest of is um is absolutely the people who are like, I met my roommate in our local group. Because again, I think that this community aspect and religion in general, sacred community, can be the thing that keeps us from despair by keeping us from loneliness. So I thought it would be fun to live into that community ideal together by treating a sentence as sacred. Um, and so I thought it would be fun. I often just do the very first line of Harry Potter, Mr. and Mrs. Dursley of number four, private driver, proud to say they were perfectly normal. Thank you very much. But I don't want it to seem like I've pre-planned that because I know that, you know, it's like a little bit of a magic trick how well this always works. And so I thought instead I could pick someone and Elizabeth, I don't know if you could help me. Maybe Elizabeth can just be you who can help me pick another sentence just from this first chapter of Harry Potter. And so if you could please pick a number between one and 17. Uh, 15, please. 15, excellent decision, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and then we'll say that there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 paragraphs on this page. Can you please pick a number between one and 12? Uh, nine. Okay, thank you. And can you please confirm to the audience that we did not pre-plan, I'm sorry, I'm just- <laughs> We did, this was, yes, 100% This is not planned. planned. We've yes. never met before. There are no holes in this ring that I'm gonna no. you. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so the line that Elizabeth and I picked together is, shh, hissed Professor McGonagall. You'll wake the muggles. So this is a moment where I'm going to invite you to unmute yourself if you are interested. So we're going to engage in Lectio Divina, which is a four-step reading practice. And the four steps, I will walk us through these again. But the four steps are what is literally happening in the sentence, what allegories come to mind, what other, um, what other stories, books, movies, TV shows, songs does this remind us of? Three, what does it remind us of in our own lives? And then four, what does this conversation make us feel called to? And this is heavily adapted from a 13th century Carthusian monastic um, practice that I would argue is actually stolen from an 11th century Jewish practice, but we can talk about that another time. But um, so we basically take away the God language. Um, but is there anybody who knows Harry Potter well enough and is willing to talk in front of the group who can tell us step one, what is literally going on in this sentence? Again, it is, shh, hissed Professor McGonagall. You'll wake the muggles. And if not, I can do it, of course. Madison has a hand raised. Yeah, I can give it a shot. Great, um, thank you. So this is in the first chapter when, um, before Harry's even really introduced as a character and they're on Privet Drive and McGonagall has just come into contact who is a professor at school who just transformed, I believe, from a cat into a professor again. And yep. she's talking to Dumbledore about, is, is this to Dumbledore? I've really set you up for a difficult one. Actually, I didn't. Elizabeth did. I'm oh. an innocent victim here. But um, it's to Hagrid. Oh, so okay. Hagrid is in the previous sentence that you've been doing so great. I'm incredibly impressed. But it's the sentence right before is then suddenly Hagrid let out a howl like a wounded dog. So Hagrid is grieving here. But sorry, please keep going. Okay, yes. Yeah, so Hagrid is grieving. And then... Um... I th I'm not sure what else needs to be set up in the sentence. What's yeah. happening there? Oh, delivering an infant child to live with some not very great people. And the term that um, McGonagall is using muggle means people who are without magic. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so good. So good. And I think the other thing that we're being introduced to here, it right it, as you were talking about with the word muggle, is that... Uh, the, the wizarding community, which we are being introduced to, um, 
is looks down upon non-magical people, right? There's a derogatory term for them. She does, she knows this family's name. They're the Jersleys. She knows that. Or at minimum, she knows it's Harry's family in there. She could say, shh, you're going to wake Harry's family. But she doesn't, right? She calls them the muggles. And so we're finding out that there's a real difference between the muggle community and the wizarding community and that they look down on one another. Exactly, Mark. There's an us and them mentality that we get introduced to just in this one sentence. We also, and Madison, you spoke about this as well, but there's we find out that there's a power dynamic between McGonagall and Hagrid, right? Hagrid would never in a million years shush McGonagall. McGonagall could be screaming at the top of her lungs in a dangerous situation. And Hagrid would be like, they're there, are you okay? Whereas McGonagall feels completely comfortable shushing Hagrid, right? And so we're finding out about that here. Um, we're, we're, again, if we have this context already, but if we didn't, right, you'll wake the muggles. We're finding out that it's most likely nighttime, if, you know, or they're napping, which I'm a big fan of napping. So all of this is in this sentence, Professor McGonagall, right? We have a title in the previous sentence where we just call him Hagrid, not Professor Hagrid. Um, so there's just a, a lot, right, in this one sentence. So Elizabeth, I'm sorry for throwing you under the bus. It's a great sentence. Thank you. So step two is what other stories does this sentence remind us of? And this helps us see the sentence in in the context of our own cultural imprints of, of the cultural, the things that have imprinted on us, not the things we've imprinted, but, and it opens our eyes to all of the other things that this sentence could mean. And so I'll read the sentence one more time. It is, shh, hissed Professor McGonagall, you'll wake the muggles. I'm happy to go first unless does somebody have their hand raised or, I see a physical hand with Teresa. Hi. Hi. Uh, um, I'm Teresa, a big, thank you. A big Harry Potter fan. Um, but, and I've read the books like more times than I'd like to count. But when I heard you read that sentence, I, I the word wake hit me differently because yeah. of the whole woke culture and like the, the not knowing and the knowing and the being aware and hmm. the not being aware. And so that hit me differently than it has before. And if there was ever someone who would pride themselves on not being awakened at all, it would be Vernon Dursley. He loves that he's a bigoted exactly. jerk. So I love that. And I never would have thought of that. That's amazing. Thank you. What about you, Grace? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Awesome. Um, I was just going to say, I'm sure that I'm not alone in this, but I have been binging Bridgerton lately and about the scene just in like a cultural context of in general, when somebody does something that's loud and attracts attention and you feel vicariously embarrassed or panicked on their behalf, it reminded me of that feeling, which is also how I felt in the first episode of season two of Bridgerton, when um, I think her name is Violet, the mother character uh, is like, Anthony's ready to get married. And like says it loudly in the book. And all the, the ladies flock. And I was like, oh no, why'd we, have to, why'd we have to do that? You know, it just reminded me of that feeling of like vicarious. Oh my God, I love Violet in that moment. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, throw him right under the bus. Do it, Violet. Oh, I love her. But that leads so well, Grace, also to what um, came to my mind, which is um, in Pride and Prejudice, Mrs. Bennett is someone, you know, Hagrid is like loud and embarrassing, right? And often can't control his emotions, but kids throughout the books are going to be like, Shh, Hagrid, like we're trying to sneak out Norbert and you're ruining our play, right? And that is definitely also true of Mrs. Bennett in Pride and Prejudice, where she, I mean, like really ruins her own bid for Jane marrying Mr. Bingley by saying so loudly at a ball, um, well, Jane's going to marry Mr. Bingley and you know he is 5,000 pounds a year, right? This like loudness outside of your, of the people who are supposed to hear it. 
and the person making the noise not understanding that they are breaking a social bond or a social barrier um, is so interesting. And what I, I what I really love now, I have forgotten the name of the person who did this because I can't see your face. I'm so sorry, Grace, right? It was Grace who just spoke. The, it, the difference <clears throat> that I love about your example is that Violet Bridgerton is doing that on purpose right? She has power and control. And she walks into a ballroom and she's like, I am going to intentionally embarrass my son because I want to, because he is too full of himself. And two, hasten this thing of him trying to find a wife. Whereas Hagrid and Mrs. Bennett embarrass themselves because they can't control it and embarrass others because they can't control it. And that control and power issue is is really interesting to me. And it's almost, it is more embarrassing. I'm not proud of this. It's more embarrassing when the person who's embarrassing adjacent to you clearly can't control it, right? If someone's embarrassing themselves, but they're in on it, right? They're singing really loudly and they know they sound bad, but they're having a great time. Like that's fun. But if somebody thinks that they sound great and they don't, that's when it's painfully mortifying, right? And I think Mrs. Bennett and Hagrid, it can be painful how they are embarrassing themselves and the people near them because they are loved. Anything else for step two? Okay, well, let's, let's move on to step three, which is what does it remind us of in our own lives? And so I feel like most of us have either shushed or been shushed. I've definitely been shushed. Um, and the sentence one more time is, shh, hiss Professor McGonagall, you'll wake the muggles. I mean, we have librarians on this call. And so I would love to hear, there is a stereotype that librarians are shushers. To me, librarians are deities. They are the purveyors of books and wisdom. And yes, I know my audience, but honestly, I say that behind your back. So I'm not even shamelessly kissing up here. But there is, right? Like that's a stereotype of like that. I mean, there's that scene. This is more step two. I apologize. In It's a Wonderful Life where it's Mary, right? The, the um, Donna, oh my God. Donna, whatever. Her last name is the actress. Mary. If Jimmy Stewart and Mary had gotten married, she would have kids and be happy and pretty and not wear glasses. But because they didn't get married, she became a librarian and had to wear glasses and became very pinched and shushy, right? Like there are these stereotypes about people who shush other people. I mean, it reminds me of moments where I've been in movies. There was one in particular. I am a huge fan of the novel Les Miserables. I would say it, you can draw a direct line from me at 14 reading that to going to divinity school. And then I am also a huge fan of the musical Les Miserables. And I am a huge fan of Hugh Jackman. I have a magnet of him on my fridge. It is, a, I have a beanie with his name on it. Like I love Hugh Jackman. And so when he got cast as Jean Valjean, like I can't even tell you how many times I watched the trailer. And then obviously I went, opening night to see it and I people were talking right and I was like you don't want to be the shusher but also they are ruining it and you have to do that calculus right of like first of all shushing in a movie theater doesn't work it just aggravates the talkers so it is ineffective as a strategy and the, all you do is get more and more upset so to shush or not to shush in that situation I find to be like a Hamlet-esque, like deeply existential question. So that is what it reminds me of in my life. Does it remind anyone here of anything in their lives? Everything. I heard a voice. No, I'm hearing voices. We won't look at that. The moment when mom is making a child laugh and they're experiencing real joy, but dad shushes them because TV. Wow, that's a bad dad. Laughter is always the better noise. <laughs> Do I hear someone? I'll stop asking. Okay, just talk if, I, if yes. Um, the last step is what is something that you feel called to based not just in the text, but in the conversation that we've ended up having. 
And so the text, the sentence one more time is, shh, hissed Professor McGonagall. You'll wake the muggles. Um, I have one. Yeah. It goes, it goes step three E into step four. Um, but it really, and especially the sentence that comes before this about Hagrid letting out the sound like a wounded animal and mm -hmm. the conversation or what you were saying about shushing often not being the answer. Um, it made me realize that Hagrid's really hurt. There's a person who's experiencing hurt and McGonagall didn't, her response wasn't to comfort him or to care for him. It was a response that, I mean, I often find myself with that impulse. I am the person who gets embarrassed and I'm like, oh, stop it, please. So I guess I'm, I'm called to react more with care. And especially mm -hmm. if there's something, I don't know, like to ask a question, maybe instead of like, oh, you seem upset. What's that about? <laughs> if someone's right. making a sense of a wounded animal instead of maybe, maybe questioning my own shushing impulses. Yeah, and you understand why tactically it's what McGonagall does, right? Like there's a there's a, a reason. Um, but I think you're exactly right. She could have been like, Hagrid, I need you to be quiet. I know, I'm so sorry. Like, we'll talk about this later, right? Like, I'm heartbroken too. This could have been a moment of connection. And instead, there's just this shush. And I, as you were talking, I'm just so grateful. The thing that it made made me feel called to is to only shush when I'm part of the problem, right? If you're up late laughing with friends and the kids are asleep in the next room and you're one of the people laughing, then being like, Shh, we all have to be quiet. But other than that, right? Like shushing, shushing might be a bad idea, right? Because of this exact thing that you brought up, that there's no compassion in a shush. There is just, all there is a pres is a presumption that you are the keeper of the norms and that you know what the norms are and you know that the other person is breaking the norms. Whereas movie theaters are public places. And yes, they are quiet public places. But like, if I wanted to watch this movie alone, like I could have gone at 10 a.m. on a Tuesday or right, like there are better and worse times to do that. And so just really wondering about why you feel as though you have the right to control someone else's speech, I think is just such a, I'm really grateful for that reflection to have compassion first and curiosity first. Does anybody else have a step four that they wanna share before we move to questions? I just wanna thank you for pointing out the power dynamics, like even in the way it's written, like Professor McGonagall versus Hagrid versus, because I don't think we're always aware of how that's always in play. That there's almost yeah. always a power dynamic in play in every situation. And I think it's very important for us to be more mindful of that. I mean, I can just give you a really humbling example of that, which is there was a woman in one of my classes in grad school who constantly was like, but we have to look at the power dynamics. And I was like, oh my God, if we have to talk about the power dynamics of everything all the time. And now in our podcast about Pride and Prejudice, we have a section about the power dynamics, right? And it was me trying to get power psychologically, right? Of diminishing her because I didn't really understand what she meant. And so I was like, oh, she's so annoying. And like, now that I've learned more, I'm like, oh no, that's actually really important to make sure we always talk about. So even just the ways that internally we try to grab power, right? By like internally mocking someone or judging someone. Power is a very interesting thing. Well, I'm happy now, Elizabeth, to take any questions. I um, I can just ask. But if anybody has any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat or raise your hand or honestly just unmute yourself. So I'll, I'll just get things started, but Great. people please put stuff in the, um, in the chat if you want to. But what's your, what's next? Like, what's your next project? So are you going to write, are you going to analyze Les Mis for us? Or, or uh, you know, are you going through like your favorites, you know, things close to your heart one by one mm -hmm. or what's, or not? If I, Do you not have a... If I did Les Mis, I, <laughs> everyone around me would want to die 
because I would just be singing the musical constantly. Um, but I, I, so I have two projects in the work. So first of all, um, we're still doing Harry Potter is sacred. We are doing it. Um, we started the books over. We finished all seven books. That is 199 chapters for those of you counting at home. And we started over because that is what you do with the Torah, right? You close it and you start over. And we're reading it through different themes, but um, we just started at the beginning. So now we're back in book three. And then I hope that that podcast keeps going. This will be the last time I do it. I don't think I, I don't know how rabbis do it and ministers do it, find something new to preach on with the same text we have here. I think I will sort of have run out of takes on Harry Potter, but I hope that we find honestly like younger people and and just different voices and the current voices to take that on because I do think that Harry Potter is is just so ubiquitous that it's special in that way um we are doing a podcast of treating romance novels as sacred and so we did Jane Eyre uh last year this year we're doing Pride and Prejudice if I if I have my druthers it'll take us two years to get through Pride and Prejudice my producer keeps saying we have to do more than one chapter at a time. And I'm like, why? We should do one paragraph for an hour. There, I just, in the one sentence about Darcy, we meet him, like him, and hate him. It's one sentence. It's not a Virginia Woolf sentence. It's a short sentence. So I'm like, we should, we, I just want to spend a year on this paragraph. But we'll see what comes next with that. We're talking about potentially Anne of Green Gables, or I'm also really interested in thinking through something like Little Women, where there's a forced romance for the author. So we'll see where that goes. But personally, um, I am writing my own romance novel. We'll see how that goes. But I'm I'm really interested in treating women's memoirs as a sacred. And so that is the next nonfiction book that I'm working on. Um, women talking to one another, gossip, right, as it's called, is how we find out who is sexually assaulting women in the media. And it's how we find out whether or not we have endometriosis or, right, like women gossiping is how we function in the world because we've been marginalized for so long. And I think women's memoirs, just like romance novels, are fascinating because financially they underwrite the entire publishing industry, and yet they are not taken seriously by the powers that be in the book industry. And so I think that like romance novels, women's memoirs need to be taken much more seriously. Eat, Pray, Love was on the bestseller list for four years, and yet it was like never culturally taken seriously. It's just like a very confusing thing to me. That to me assumes that culture assumes that most women are idiots. So I think that those books should be looked at. So yeah, that's my next you. project. Yeah. Well, that's great. We'll we'll have to, I don't know, pay attention and put a Google alert out or something on your name so we can see when that comes out. Right, give me have the another... last book took me eight years. So <laughs> give me six more years. Okay. All right. <laughs> um so there's a question here about the exercise we just went through. And do you think does that amount to prayer? Does prayer have to address something or someone? So Guigo II called, the, who, um, who's the person who sort of codified this practice and wrote it down. And he has a very short essay called The Ladder of Monks that you can, um, that you can find really easily online and is super readable. Um, so he called the last step prayer because it is when you are asking God to tell you what to do. Um, And he said that if you're really lucky, right, you lower a ladder down into the text. And if you're really lucky, this practice actually ends up being a ladder that you climb where you can glimpse heaven. And so I, I consider it prayer. It is how I practice prayer, whether or not I, I am not here to prescribe prayer, define it for other people. But I know for me, it's the closest thing to God's love that I've ever felt when I feel as though an author from 10 years ago, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, understands something about me that I've never been able to articulate before, right? Like that feels like God's love, right? That is love in the ether. (laughs) That is Charlotte Bronte saying, I know you, you know, Vanessa, 
from 200 years in the future, even though she never could have imagined a person like me. Um, and so I, I find this to be very prayerful. And I, I would imagine that most people have that experience where you feel so seen by a book that it, it just lights you up. So I would say yes, but you tell me. Mm-hmm. No, thank you. I appreciate that. I, I, I think that's true. You can have that moment of connection with, with art in general, and, and you're showing us how we can have that with literature. Um, and it relates to the, another question that has come in through the chat about, you know, when you said about at Harvard Divinity, you felt there was a lack of connection and discussions of, you know, theology on the one side and literature on the other, and you're really, you know, doing both of those things at once. So, um, can you describe that a little bit, the difference between theology and the literature of Judaism in particular? Yeah, so I will say that like religion and literature has just like gone in and out of fashion over the last hundred years, which I'm sure that the professors here can speak to much better than I have. Like there was a program called religion and literature at Harvard for a number of years and then there wasn't and now there is again, like in just the last two years, it's something you can get your PhD in again. And I think there are all, all sorts of reasons that it goes in and out of favor. I do think one of them is that literature is a woman's subject and religion is a man's subject, coded wise, right? Coded by the university. And so I, I think that as women's studies departments were popular in the seventies, this was like accepted again. And as they lost favor in the eighties and nineties, whatever. I think that there are a lot of political reasons as to why that happens. Um, I was told, so I have this one complaint about divinity school, which is that I felt like we were always talking about God and belief and not practice, not how to talk to a patient who just got a cancer diagnosis. And then my very good friend, who's an Episcopal priest in North Carolina and is brilliant named Noah Van Neal said, every class that I was in, you ruined because I felt like I couldn't talk about God. So like, you know, and I was like, you always wanted to talk about God and not practice, right? So like, it was my experience. Um, my complaint is just like, it, it's just a very specific one about HDS that I, I just think that it's pluralism is rooted in Episcopal and Unitarian traditions. And it likes to pretend that it is truly pluralistic and it just isn't right. Like the, and they are addressing these things. There is now a prayer space that is like a non-theistic prayer space. The, the, the multicultural room had a huge cross in it. Right. So like there was just this constant pretense that wasn't entirely a pretense. I think there was a genuine desire, but we were constantly being told that it wasn't a Christian institution when Christianity was the default. It was the thing that didn't have to be named. It was, um, it was always the assumed identity of everybody. And so, and I was constantly asked by other students quite fairly, like, if you're a Jewish atheist, why are you here? And I'm like, well, I was, I want to talk to people when they're dying. And I don't think you need to believe in God for that. And I thought I'd learn about that here. So I, I think it is, it, pluralism is really hard. Multiculturalism is really hard, especially at a pre-existing organization, starting new organizations. Hard. Like these are, incredibly complicated things um i don't resent it i just i was frustrated by it mm-hmm. well, i appreciate that i mean at the gq being interreligious is our calling card and it's, it's right. a daily practice speaking of practice it's you know work every day um to to do that but yeah um, yeah so we appreciate that comment um so maybe just one one final question if you don't right. mind and that no. is that um and Mark, I may need some clarity on this. So he's commending you on your skill of bringing out these important questions and leading us to these additional implications. Um, but he also says these issues are, and these issues do become much more accessible through popular books. I wonder though, what is gained or missed by choosing to place such te- texts as sacred as opposed to others? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot, <laughs> um, like, right? It, which is why the title of this talk and the way that I really try to talk about it is that sacred is the act, not the thing. It is the mm-hmm. act of treating something as sacred that matters. Um, but certainly diversity of texts really matter. It is something, my book, I have in the opening, I talk about the fact that I don't, I talk about Jane Eyre, but I also talk about Great Gatsby, Little Women, and oh, and, Her- and Harry Potter. 
And I like some of my favorite books are written by authors of color. And I was like, I don't want to risk appropriating. Right. But in not risking appropriation, I'm risking erasure. And like, right, like we live in a broken society and there's no good way to walk. Right? Like you can't walk on broken glass. Like it's just these are impossible situations where there's no right answer, but there are better answers than others. Um, and I know that I have made a lot of missteps in that, but I, I think that we risk all sorts of things by prioritizing certain texts and not others. Um, and I'm very moved by it, the, our last season on Jane Eyre, we spent a lot of time asking the question specifically of should this book remain in the canon and what is the canon? And I'll just say, I don't know if this was just like a cop out, but we had Marlon James, the amazing Haitian writer, um, on our show. And he was like, look, I'm black. I'm an immigrant in the United States. I'm gay. If I threw out every book that was hateful toward me, I wouldn't be able to read. So like, I love Jane Eyre and I'm going to keep reading Jane Eyre. And I think that we, we sort of copped, like hid under that. We we're like, Marlon James anointed us. It's fine. Right. And he speaks for everyone. Um, and so it's obviously much more complicated than that, but you know, the conclusion of our season was like, essentially, I hope it remains a book in a canon, but I hope that we have more and more canons. Um, so sorry, that might have been evading the answer, but it's the best I got. No, I, I appreciate it. I think that was a really thoughtful answer. We're all just doing the best we can and it, you know, changes um, as we grow over time. Oh, Thank you so much for having me. Oh, sorry. Can you repeat the name of the writer you just shared? Maybe we could put it oh, in Oh, Marlon chat. James. Marlon James. I have his book right here. I can show you my favorite of his books. <laughs> A Brief History of Seven Killings. And the second book in the series just came out. And it's incredible. It, it, yeah, it won the man booker. Big, big deal. Wonderful man. Great Thank Caribbean you. accent. Thank you so, so much. For audio. Fantastic. Um, Vanessa, what a great evening we've had. Uh, thank you so much for being with us. It was, um, I knew it was going to be really fun and engaging and uh, it, you know, it was, my expectations were absolutely met. <laughs> and thank you. We didn't hear from uh, Rory though. I was just thinking that too. She was so good. But other than that. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> I'm know. sorry. She I'm was so riveted she to the discussion. Yeah. I, I was just listening. Next time. Well, so, thank you um, all just so to much close for the having evening me. out, I want to I want to introduce our library director, Colin Walmut, to um, say the final words for tonight. But for me, thank you so much, Vanessa. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Thank you so much, Vanessa, um, for as Elizabeth said, such an engaging and thought provoking conversation. And we were just ending on such a juicy question too. It's always so frustrating. Uh, but thank you all for attending this, the 29th reading of the Sacred Text Lecture. Uh, we do hope to see you all next year in person for the 30th. And we can all pray together that the building uh, alterations will be complete and we can welcome you to the new library space and the new building. So we can hope for that. In the meantime, if you want to continue engaging in uh, community building with these types of issues, you can also check out GTUX, where we have short offerings from our professors on topics such as psychedelics and religious experience, eco-spirituality, um, pilgrimage. So these are available. Um, and we encourage you to, again, reach out to engage with uh, community on, on these topics of interest to all of us. So thank you again, and hope to see you next year.